Good morning. Welcome to our uh, Sunday service and uh, I welcome you as we come to God's Word and we desire to hear from Him and we desire to learn from Him. God's Word is so applicable to our lives and it touches you know, what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And as we've been going through the Psalms, um, you know, it's really been connecting with a lot of uh, the emotions and a lot of the feelings that we've been going through, especially during this time of, you know, kind of increased fear, increased anger, increased hatred, as, uh, you know, a lot of our Asian American brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles and grandma and grandpas um, are, are feeling the, uh, the weight of these times. Um, but as we, as we think about the, you know, what's going on with, um, racism and, and anti-Asian hatred, you know, one of the, the most common solutions that we find is education. That, you know, it's just people don't know enough or people, you know, don't, don't either, us as Asians, we don't know the history of, of that which, you know, we've gone through in the U.S. and, and why uh, we've come to the place where we are now. Or those that are doing the hate, hating, you know, they, they lack knowledge because they don't, they don't know us, they don't know what we've been through. Um, a lot of them are just lashing out in anger, lashing out in fear. Um, and so the solution is, is education and information, which for the most part is good, but that doesn't encompass all the, the problem. There are a lot of people who are acting out in, in ignorance, uh, you know, that they don't know what they're doing and, and when they you know, they, they see what is really going on, then they'll repent. You know, just like what we looked at last week in Psalm chapter 51, David was really deep in the sin. You know, he just doubled down into his sin with Bathsheba. But when the prophet Nathan came and showed him his sin, he turned around and, and he turned back to the Lord and he repented of all things that he did. And that's all well and good. You know, that piece of information, that, that conviction, turn the whole thing around. But there's a whole nother group of people that, you know, are taking advantage of this, you know, this cultural situation. And, and they are just bent on violence and evil. Last year, with uh, with all the protest over you know Black Lives Matters and uh, you know lots of you know lots of protests, lots of you know street rallies, there were some people that would just show up just to make mischief, just to be able to do violence, just to be able to break store windows and and steal things and loot or hurt people or shoot people and and these kinds of people it doesn't really seem that information is going to do anything because they're they're not there out of an ignorance of spirit they're there because they actually want to do evil and so what do we say to such a person how do we how do we treat them how do we biblically Look at what's going on. How can how do we see what's spiritually happening behind the scenes? And so that brings us to Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51. And and one thing that I think, you know, maybe the one thing that I'm gonna personally take away from this sermon series through Psalms is just how connected the Psalms are. You know, I always believed that the Psalms were just a, a collection of, of Psalms, kind of like our hymnal. Right? You take our hymnal, but you, you never just go straight like, 
Okay, well, since we sang hymn number 11, well then, obviously, the next hymn to sing is, uh, is Psalm number 12. You know, that, that never happens when we, you know, uh, when we ask for people to pick psalms, you know, during breaking of bread, during the combined service, you know, it's it's just whatever psalm they want to sing, and you know, maybe it's from the beginning of the hymnal, and then the next hymn is from the the you know the middle, and the next psalm is from the end, and and next hymn, you know, who knows, back and forth all over the place, because it's not really it's it's grouped by kind of theme, generally speaking. But, you know, there's no interconnectedness. The, each hymn is written in its own particular time and place and setting, and they're not interconnected at all. But yet the Psalms, uh, we've, as we've gone through them, you know, I've really seen that that's not that way for the Psalms. Even though, yes, they are kind of, you know, they're not written together, they're not written chronologically, they're not going to read like a narrative, they're not going to, you know, you know, you don't need to start from the start to go to the finish, but yet the hymns, are, the psalms are very interconnected. And so last week when we were in Psalm 51, we, we looked at that repentant spirit. And now we come to Psalm 52, and we come to this unrepentant spirit. What do we do with this unrepentant spirit? So I'm going to read Psalm 52. It's really short. So maybe our sermon is going to be short. I don't know. Probably not. I apologize. Um, because there is a lot of Old Testament uh, context to get through, uh, but I'll try to make it as concise as I can. Psalm 52, let's read it and then I'll pray for us so we can under have understanding and apply it to our lives. Psalm chapter 52, to the choir master, a masquil of David, when Deog De the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we come to your word, and Lord, we desire to come with an open mind and an open heart uh, to hear the words that you have to say to us. Holy Spirit, be working in our hearts. Use the word of God to transform us. Use this time that we have together this morning to discipline us, to conform us into the image of your Son, to shave away that which is unholy, to put to death that which is sinful, and to make us more and more holy. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the context of this psalm is in that kind of little preface. This is a psalm of David of Maskeel, a kind of psalm. When Doeg, the Edomite, came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. And some of us, um, probably not many of us, say, oh yeah, that story. And then <laughs> probably most of us are be like, what? 
What story is that? I don't remember that story in Sunday school. Uh, so let's just flip over really quickly to 1 Samuel chapter 21. And this is the context. So we get a glimpse, uh, we set the scene, and we know what kind of mindset David's in as he's writing this psalm. First Sa Samuel chapter 21 is where David is fleeing Saul. Jonathan has told David, my father Saul is trying to kill you. And so David is running away, he's fleeing, and he comes to um, Nob, chapter 21, verse 1. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. Okay, oh, here, here's where we get Ahimelech. So we know he's a priest. He's living in a place called Nob. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I sent you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but here is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. Uh, so here we have... Um, the story of David, he's on the run, and he comes to Ahimelech the priest and asks for some food for his men. He doesn't have any food, he just has the consecrated bread. Uh, so, you know, if you're familiar with the New Testament more, uh, this is the story um, the, uh, where, where the, uh, the Pharisees are getting into coffee with Jesus, as they normally do, and uh, about eating on the Sabbath and, uh, and, or eating what's unclean. And, and Jesus points to this story here in 1 Samuel saying, didn't you know that when David uh, was, was kneading bread, he took the bread from the, the, the sanctuary. He took the holy bread. And so here's where that story is. But here, this is, we're looking at, you know, what's, what's happening. Because this is, this, this birth, the psalm that we're in this morning. So something really kind of unsettling happens, right? So we're in the middle of the story. David's getting bread. Uh, he wants a weapon. Um, they don't have any weapons, but they have the sword of Goliath. So he takes that. And then in the middle of the story, in verse 7, we have this verse. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. And that's it. That's all we hear about Doeg in this chapter. And it's just randomly inserted, but it, it forebodes something. It's kind of like when you're watching a movie, like it's a suspense movie or it's a horror movie, and you you get this kind of uh, you know benign benign scene where you know the the main character is talking, and then suddenly the director zooms into you know an, another you know someone who's just watching and listening in, and then he 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 swaps the camera angle back to the main characters. And you know he's done that for a reason. You know this forebodes something bad. Something bad is going to happen. And, and David knows and we're kind of tipped off. Something bad is going to happen. Uh, David knows because at the end of the next chapter he says, I knew it. I knew it when I saw Doeg there. He was going to cause trouble. But we're foreshadowed with verse 7. So let's see what happens, why this blows up in this Psalm chapter 52 about evil. All right, so next chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 22, uh, verse 6. Now Saul heard that David was discovered and the men who were with him. David was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. 
And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. All right, so Saul is, you know, he's annoyed he can't find David and he's taking out on his own people. So he's sitting at Gibeah and he's, you know, he's telling his whole, all, all his people, you guys are conspiring against me because you guys are siding with David and not with me because none of you know where David is. Now there's a second piece of foreboding. It's the place where Saul's sitting. Saul is sitting at Gibeah. Now, I don't know if that name rings a bell, but during my Bible reading this week, even I came across it. It's at the end of Judges, it's the very last story, and it's, you know, it's kind of the most gut-wrenching, uh, just hard to swallow stories in almost all of scripture. I remember when we were doing it uh, for fellowship or Bible study. When I, was, when I was studying that last story, I just, I just felt like dirty, like shell shocked at what happened there. Uh, and some of you, if you've been doing your reading and if you started at the, at the beginning of the Bible and you've gone through every day till now, you have gone through it already. Uh, but Judges, the last story in Judges is a Levite is traveling with his concubine and they stop at the city of Gibeah in Benjamin. And an old man puts them up for the night. Uh, the evening comes and the men of the city come and, and knock at the door, pound at the door and ask the old man to bring out his guests, bring out the man, the Levite, so they can have sex with him. Um, you know, of course the host says no, you know, and, and what ends up happening is they start getting violent. The, the Levite's concubine gets thrown out the door and they abuse her till morning and she dies. The Levite grabs his concubine, throws him on, throws her on the donkey, brings her home, chops up, dismembers the dead body and mails it to all the tribes of Israel. You know, he's demanding justice. And, and all the other tribes of, of Israel show up. They get the summons, this bloody summons. And, and they, you know, they want retribution. They want justice done on Gibeah. Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, doubles down. And they say, Gibeah is our, our city. We are going to defend Gibeah. And so it turns out the tribe of Benjamin is going to fight against all the other tribes of Israel. And it almost gets completely wiped out. Um, and it's just a horrible story. And of course, if you know the book of Judges, it's trying to illustrate the fact of you know what happens when mankind is left to his own devices. You know, this is what mankind looks like without God. Everyone decides what is right in his own eyes. You know, there's no authorities anywhere else. There's no, you know, morals, no, you know, any, all that, all this stuff goes out the window and, and everyone's just doing what they think is right. So, you know, the beginning of the story, the concubine leaves the Levite in the beginning, which, you know, started this whole mess. She thought she was right, abandoning her husband, um, them going to, uh, to Gibeah and the Gibeonites wanting to uh, engage in not only homosexual relationships, but also rape. They thought that was right. Um, the men inside the house throwing out the concubine, they thought that was right. Um, and then the men outside, you know, mistreating her and even causing her death, murder. They thought that was right. 
the Levite chopping up the dead corpse and mailing it out to the other tribes of Israel. He thought that was right. Benjamin sticking out for Gibeah's sin. They thought that was right. Israel almost wiping out Benjamin. They thought that was right. Uh, and so it's just, it's just horrible. The whole story is absolutely, absolutely horrible. And all this because of this name Gibeah. And so when first Samuel mentions Saul is at Gibeah, judges should automatically spring to mind. It's, it's kind of like that, you know, a few weeks ago I mentioned this Star Trek episode where this alien race speaks in metaphor. You know, so it, it's speaking the same kind of language here. First Samuel, it says, Saul at Gibeah. And we we're supposed to know the Levi at Gibeah. We know something horrible is going to happen. And something horrible does. Saul calls, uh, well actually, Saul calls out for news of David. No one tells him anything, but Doeg is there. Doeg says, I know, I saw David with Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech gave him bread and Goliath's sword. Saul summons Ahimelech says, why are you conspiring against me? Ahimelech says, you know, David's your most trusted servant. What am, you know, I'm on your side. I'm just doing what you would want. Uh, you know, he doesn't know of this break between Saul and David. Uh, but Saul commands his, his men, his soldiers to kill Ahimelech the priest and kill all the priests. Of course, all the rest of his soldiers are kind of more clear-headed than Saul is at the moment. And they say, we are not going to kill the priests. We are not going to kill God's anointed people. Saul's like, Doeg, you're the man. Doeg is Saul's man. And he takes his sword and he kills Ahimelech and he kills all the priests. He kills all the priests' wives children, livestock. Uh, it says, um, let's see where it is. Um, do, 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 do. Um, verse 18, he, he killed 85 priests and their family and their livestock. 85 families, 85 85, I guess that would be adult males that can serve as priests. This Doeg kills in cold blood. David hears about it. And in his anguish, he, he tells the one remaining son of Ahimelech, I will be your shelter. I will protect you because I brought this on you. The other thing he says is Psalm chapter 52. So that's the context. Now Psalm 52 makes sense. Why do you boast of evil, O oh mighty man? This is ironic, right? Doeg is not a mighty man. The mighty men were the soldiers who refused to kill the priests. Doeg is Saul's person in charge of the herds. He's an administrator, maybe. He's a you know chief shepherd, who knows. But he's not a warrior. But he is, in his own eyes, a mighty warrior. He is wielding the sword for Saul. Willing to do Saul's dirty work, doing what the Saul's other mighty men were not willing to do. So David ironically calls Doeg mighty man, you know, very sarcastically, of course. But why do you boast in evil? It's like Doeg has completely given himself over to evil. This is not a fluke. This is not a mistake. It's not some lack of knowledge, some like ignorance that Doeg 
shed all his blood. No, this is out of evil. This is out of the nature of mankind. In the last psalm we looked at, you know, David saying this, that his sin is, comes from within him. It's not a mistake. We are by nature evil, sinful. You know, we are not, as our culture would say, you know, good by default. And we are ruined by, you know, external forces, by our environment, whatever. No, the Bible says we are by nature evil. And here, Doeg, in light of you know all the information that he has, he knows that Saul's uh, you know warriors will refuse to kill these people. And yet he doubles down on his sin not only reporting to, to Saul where David is and ratting out Ahimelech, uh, but he is willing to just flat out kill them in cold blood. So he is boasting of evil, not that he's you know, physically uh, you know, mouthing the words of, ha ha, I'm so evil, you know, insert maniacal laughter here, but he is giving himself holy to evil. And this is how David describes him. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of death. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, oh deceitful tongue. And we hear the anguish in David's voice. Why did you tell Saul you killed Ahimelech with your words long before you killed him with your sword. But then in verse 2, there's this very strange kind of interlude or, you know, break in the description of how evil Doe is. David says this. The steadfast love of God endures all the day. It's so random sounding. But David is writing this psalm as a sandwich. Right, so there's two parts, the beginning and the end, and then there's the middle. And the kind of the bread parts talks about God's faithfulness, God's steadfast love, his has said love. His love that is loyal to the people of his covenant. The, the love that forgives David when he sins and turns back to God. So that's in verse 1, second part of verse 1. And it's also at the end in verse 8 and 9. Verse 8, but I am like a tree, a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. And so the, the sandwich part, the, the bread part, is David saying, God, you are my refuge. This is right out of Psalm 51. God, you turn me around. God, I put my trust, my refuge in you. And so I am safe and I'm secure. What David is pointing to is the main kind of root cause to everything that's happening with Doeg. And, and as we look at, you know, hatred against Asian Americans or hatred against, you know, our black brothers and sisters, um, <laughs> hatred or discrimination of all kinds in this world, it is at its core, at its very, very core, an issue of refuge, an issue of safety. Why do we hate and bring, tear other people down? Because we are unsafe. We are unsecure. Why can we weather the storm? How can we trust in God? Because he is our shelter, our refuge and so that forms the the 
the sandwich, the, the bread part of the sandwich. That this is in the context of us as the believers, us as people who have, as David does in Psalm 51, we have come, we have acknowledged our sins, we have, we know uh, that we are sinful, and we have turned to God and put our refuge in Him. And so the opposite must be true of the evil person, of this person who is just solely out to do evil. His refuge, her refuge, is not in the Lord. And so that's the, the middle part of the sandwich. Or, you know, if you're not into sandwiches, if you like cookies better, this is the cream filling. And this is kind of, you know, in this kind of poetry, this would be the main point. Verse 5. What does God do with such an evil man? But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. David sees that Doeg is acting out of his insecurity because God is not his refuge. Doeg's refuge seems to be Saul. And he is willing to do anything Saul tells him, anything that would benefit Saul. Whether it be ratting David and Ahimelech out, or killing over 80 people, well, probably it's over 100 people, and children and livestock in cold blood. Why? It's because his refuge is Saul. And Saul's gone crazy, and he's gone evil crazy too. But at the end of the day, if God is not your refuge, David says something interesting. If God is not your refuge, if he is not your shelter, then God is the exact opposite for you. Look at the language that he uses in verse 5 to 7 break you down forever, right? A shelter builds you up. A shelter makes you feel secure. But God is going to break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He's taking away that which makes you feel secure. He's taking away that which uh, gives you shelter, that tent. God's going to take that away. He will uproot you from the land. When something is rooted, it's secure. That's why David says in verse 8, when he says, you know, God is my refuge, I am like a green olive tree. Green olive trees were, is, are one of the most long-lived trees in the world. You know, they can bear fruit and live for hundreds of years. That's what it's like to have his refuge in God. He's safe, he's secure, he's long-lived. But if your refuge is not God, God is going to uproot you, he says in verse 5. Such is the man who will not take refuge in God. God is either your refuge or your peril. That's what David says. And that is the main point of this psalm. Right? If we try to sum it up in one sentence, God is your refuge, or God is your peril. And this is the spiritual insight that David has into this man, Doeg, in the midst of you know this horrible thing happening. Um, this is what David sees. Our refuge can be in God, or our refuge, uh, or God can be our peril. God will be our destruction. It's a very short psalm, very straightforward, but it has deep implications for how we live, and especially during this time, 
how we respond to what's going on. Whether it's done to others, whether we read it on the news, or whether it's done to us personally. In uh, growing up in high school, actually in junior high, actually from elementary school <laughs> upwards, I grew up in, you know, I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up in Long Island. I grew up in a very small town that was predominantly Jewish and Italian. And, uh, and I was one of only maybe a handful of non-white looking people in the school. Right. We, we almost had no black students, very, very few uh, Hispanic students, and very few Asian students. So, of course, you know, that makes you stand out a lot. And it makes you, uh, as is usually the case, unfortunately, um, the, the target for bullying and the target for discrimination. And so growing up, you know, going into, you know, through middle school and high school, uh, you know, I wasn't a social outcast, but I definitely felt the racism. I felt the, you know, unfair treatment. And, and I was very angry. I was a very angry teenager. Which, you know, maybe a lot, of, maybe that just comes with the territory of being a teenager. Um, but I was a very angry teenager. Uh, you know, people would pick on me and I would spend my days, you know, thinking of, you know, if only I could get back at these people. You know, if only I had the power, if only I had the ability to get back at these people, what I would do to them. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of why there's such an abundance of, of literature and uh, TV shows and movies and anime and manga and manhwa about, you know, people who get picked on and then they finally get these superpowers and they finally can fight back. It's kind of a wish fulfillment because a lot of us get picked on and a lot of us wish we could get back at these people who torment us. But when I came to faith, when I read through the Bible and God spoke to me and God changed my heart and God convicted me of sin and I trusted in Jesus as my savior, one of my, actually, no, my favorite verse was Romans chapter 12. So much so that when most people think Romans chapter 12, they think, so offer your bodies as living sacrifices. I didn't even know that verse in high school. And so when people, you know, talk about Romans 12, I always thought the end of, end of Romans 12, verse 19. Beloved, Never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That was one of my first verses that I memorized. Do not avenge yourself, but leave room for the vengeance of God. This is how we are to respond to what's going on. Now, I'm not saying we're not supposed to seek justice. Justice is godly. In fact, Paul writes that God gives authority to the rulers to enact justice. And if we don't see justice happening, it most definitely is the burden of Christians to say, government, you need to be bringing justice because this is why God gave you the authority in the first place. And if you do not do your job, if you do not use your authority to give justice, if you instead oppress and you hold up those that you know, commit the injustice, 
God's judgment is going to be on you and and God, you know, God is going to take away that authority that he gave you. And, and we don't want to see God, you know, totally up upend this country and tear it down because we live here and we love it. But yet, we need to stand up for justice because God is a God of justice. And so if we see injustice, whether it's done to other people or it's done to ourselves, by all means, we are to call the authorities to account and say, you need to give justice because that is why God has put you on this earth. That is why God has given you authority to bring justice to the oppressed. But for us personally, we don't usually want to seek justice. We want to seek revenge. And so, well, you know, we are to leave a lot in the hands of the authorities or to empower the authorities or to enable the authorities or to prod and nag the authorities to give justice. Personally, how we are supposed to respond is with an absence of revenge. And this is hard when we have personal enemies come after us. This is hard when other people hate us for no reason. This is hard when people do evil, for, uh, evil to us and are unrepentant. Like Doeg. Just in it for evil's sake. Romans tells us, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the vengeance of God. That's what Psalm 52 tells us. If God is not their refuge, and if they are acting out of hate, God is not their refuge. If God is not the refuge, God will be the one to uproot them. God will be the one to tear down their tent. God will be the one to destroy them forever. God's vengeance is complete and it's absolute. And he will have it if God is not the refuge. But what does that mean for us? It means that we are freed up from that feeling of vengeance. We do not need to plot how we get back at them, how we are going to get our revenge, how we are going to make everything, you know, right, satisfactory in our own eyes. We leave that to God. God, your vengeance is coming and it is much more terrifying than anything I can come up with. So if we are freed from vengeance, now how do we respond? We respond with love. Verse 20 of Romans 12. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. One of my favorite characters in Lord of the Rings, and you thought you were going to make it through a sermon without a Lord of the Rings reference, I'm sorry. But my favorite character, or one of my favorite characters, is the character of Far Faramir. Faramir? Faramir? However you say it. Um, but he is Boromir's brother, and he is the son, the second son, of Denethor, steward of Gondor. And it says in the books that he is very much like his father in that he can read into people's hearts and minds. And, and something that the movies changed, which is one of the reasons why I do not like the movies, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, is because they changed the character of Far Faramir. But Faramir in the books is a wonderful, wonderful character. His father reads the hearts of people. And what he reads there causes him to scorn. But Faramir reads the hearts of men and it leads him to pity. 
And that should be our response. We see people hate us. We see people hate those like us. Our response is we see them acting out of the fear of God not being their shelter. God is not their refuge. And so they're depending on something as their refuge, as what they're basing their whole lives on. And that thing is in danger. And so they strike out in anger and evil. And we see that and we act in pity and we reach out in love. They can beat us. And we can say, I forgive you. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus hung on the cross. And as he's beaten, bloodied, and in pain, he can say, God, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. The turnaround for me as an angry teen <laughs> into, you know, a Christian was, you know, one time I was imagining as, you know, as some as a teenager facing hatred, facing discrimination, facing racism, you know, I, I had these deep wells of hatred. I had these deep wells of resentment, of anger. And as I you know, read God's word and as I uh, you know, became sanctified by the blood of Jesus, one of the things that was amazing happened was I could reach down into these barrels, these wells that used to hold hatred. And instead, as I put my finger into these reservoirs that used to hell hold hatred, I put my finger and instead felt a hole, a nail hole in Jesus' hands. That's what replaced my hatred. And as Christians, we have this unique ability like no one else has to forgive to do good when evil is done to us. When we're facing racism, beatings, attacks, whether verbal or physical, and we can return and say, I love you. We can say to them, beware the judgment to come because God is going to tear you down and I don't want that to happen. I want God to be your refuge, just like he is mine. Psalm chapter 53. God is your refuge, or God is your destruction. Let that give you peace this week. As God is your shelter and his steadfast love endures all day. Let that free you from anger. Let that free you from resentment. Let that free you from the need to get revenge. And free you to love. And free you to forgive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is a hard word this morning. It is a hard situation that we're in culturally. It is a hard situation as we face fear just going out in public. Are we going to be attacked? Are we going to be abused? We don't know. We feel evil is waiting, eh, waiting for us, lying in wait. Father, we thank you, first of all, that you are our refuge. 
that we don't need to live in fear, that we are like green olive trees with roots that run deep. That your steadfast love lasts all day, every day, never stopping, never ceasing. Lord, draw us into that love. Draw us to the cross in your greatest display of love. Free us from the need to get revenge, free us from anger, free us from hatred. Lord, that's, that's your department. You are gonna bring the judgment. You are gonna bring the retribution. That's not our business. That's not our responsibility. So free us from that, free us to love, free us to forgive. Though they may crush us, we will still respond in love. Help us, help us by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.